Gents, integrate the shadow of your masculinity before it drags you to hell. In this book review of men's work by Connor Beaton, I'm going to explain why and how. Sorry about this quick interruption. I've got an important call to action for you. Please go watch this video and subscribe to Limitless Mindset over on one of the alt tech platforms, Rumble or Odyssey. And that is where you can catch my latest videos along with browsing my entire library of content and videos and podcasts. Over 700 pieces of edifying content about biohacking, nootropics, smart drugs, anti-aging, life hacking, about my pragmatic full spectrum anti-fragility philosophy. If you value health freedom, I urge you to get outside of your digital comfort zone just a little and vote for the kind of future you want with your attention. Join and use the pro free speech social media platforms. I have the links below this video to where you can connect with me on those platforms. I do pay more attention to the comments that I get on those. Please don't procrastinate any further in taking back your freedom and your privacy from big tech. Don't even pause this video. Just pick one of the alt tech platforms. I think that Odyssey is the best. It's kind, it's a lot like YouTube. It's as good as YouTube as a video platform, but there's no annoying ads interrupting the videos. So just pick one of those. Again, I've got them linked below and join it in another tab or window while we get back to what you clicked on. But if you'll give me just a little bit of a preamble, let me give you a little bit of inside baseball on the personal development podcasting biz. So you have no doubt in your podcasting feeds came across innumerable examples of these book author interviews. I've listened to hundreds of these, if not thousands of these. And these book author interviews that you find so often are kind of sort of what we could describe as low effort content from the podcaster. These podcasts, these author interview things, and I've done a couple of them, but these are largely kind of a layup. These are often, often kind of easy work for the podcaster because they've got an author that is ostensibly subject matter expert on some topic and the author is looking to sell books and so they're more than happy to come on podcasts and the podcast interviewer often just often doesn't have to contribute a ton to these podcasts. In fact, what happens a lot of times is these authors have PR agents and these PR agents just say, okay, dear podcaster, here is the author's bio and here are 10 takeaways from the book and here are 10 questions that you can ask the author and then the author is going to give very similar responses to these 10 questions as they have on all the other podcasts that they have appeared. And so in a lot of incidences, the podcaster themselves doesn't even read the book. They just read the email that the PR agent sends them and then they just 
parrot those questions back to the podcaster and then uh, and then <laughs> and then dot 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 profit uh, they make money from affiliate sales of the books, although though you really don't get paid very much by Amazon for making those affiliate sales. It just barely pays my hosting bill over here. Um, or a lot of times those authors and the PR agencies just pay the podcaster to do really not that much work. And so in this book review and in most of my book reviews, I do something different, which is that I spend uh, 5, 10, 15, 20 hours reading the book and then I do some more, I do often more research on it. And then in this podcast, as opposed to just giving you kind of generic sound bites to encourage you to spend your money on the book, I try to often, I try to save you from reading the book. I try to give you like a succinct, the succinct takeaways from the book so that if you don't have the time to read the book, don't want to spend the money on the book, you can still get some value out of the book. So uh, maybe that's one of the reasons why uh, some of these uh, authors uh, don't love my book reviews. They don't like some of them. Sometimes they share them around and say, hey, thanks, man. That was awesome. But uh, yeah, I don't I'm probably not. Uh, creating a ton of goodwill for myself with authors in the publishing industry because sometimes I'm helping you to uh, shortcut the reading and the buying of some books by trying to just give you the good stuff that you need in these podcasts because I know how busy you are and how uh, finite the amount of time is that you can spend on personal development stuff. And so if that's something that you appreciate, then please let me know by, you can leave my podcast a uh, thumbs up, you can leave it a five star review, whatever those algorithm comments, all that good stuff, all those algorithmic kind of signals that you could read, that you could leave wherever you are watching or listening to me, those are really appreciated. And that helps for Limitless Mindset to get pushed just a little bit higher up with these podcasts that I think some of these other podcasts that are more popular, I think they are, again, kind of doing a low effort approach in a lot of cases. And I feel like I should be competing with them a little bit more in the top spots. So yeah, I really do appreciate those things, uh, those algorithmic kinds of things that you can do. And then if you also find what I'm doing here and what I just described to be like a high integrity kind of thing, then you can support me on Substack starting at $7 a month. And I think there's a discount running through the month of December if you wanted to get a uh, yearly supporting my Substack. And the Substack support, it honestly doesn't actually get you that much more than what you can get for free on my website or on my uh, channels on social media but it gets you that sunk cost motivation where you're spending a little bit of money on the edifying content and information that you're getting about life hacking, biohacking, all that good stuff from me. So you're just going to have that much more motivation to apply what you are learning. Sometimes you don't need more information. Sometimes what you need to do is apply more of the information that you are getting. And you can do that from $7 a month over on my Substack, which I've got linked below. Okay, so let's talk about men's work and masculinity and some of the great things that I've learned from this book. So recently I have gotten into listening to the uh, masculinity sphere of podcasts. Back in the day, I would follow a, a lot of the uh, manosphere kind of content, which I got a lot out of, but um, it has its own biases and sometimes it can be uh, kind of negative and yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So the masculinity sphere is a little bit different than the manosphere. It's kind of like more holistic. And so I've been listening to a ton of podcasts in this whole sphere of the internet. And some of them are uh, like really right wing leaning and traditionalist and men that are really not very happy about the state of society. And some of them are kind of like left wing uh, leaning, and then some of them are, uh, you know, centrist. Uh, so I'm getting like a good uh, uh, panoply of uh, perspectives on things. And a lot of these masculinity podcasts, they kind of suck. A lot of them I'm not real impressed with. One that doesn't suck is Man Talks with Connor Beaton. So I dove into his personal growth book for men entitled men's work and my wife is really funny she intentionally uh says that book is called men at work right and i'm like no men's work M men at work would be like i don't know a construction site or something like this this one is men's work and this book really doesn't suck in fact it's one of the books that i might recommend uh that i'd actually probably recommend that you read even though i'm going to give you some good stuff out of it here and this book really lives up to the second word of its subtitle, which is a practical guide to face your darkness and self-sabotage and find freedom. And this is a book about a topic that I'll admit I've kind of shied away from for a while, and that is shadow work. You've heard about this maybe from uh, like Jordan Peterson, maybe from those kinds of people. And this comes out of Jungian psychology. You're probably aware of that. And your shadow is not bad or good, but your shadow will royally fuck with your life if you don't integrate it consciously. The book explains. And this is where the shadow exists. It is the conglomeration of all you have tried not to be, wanted to hide from others, and avoided about yourself. It is the insecurity you hide in your relationships, the neediness you can't control, the lies you tell your family, and the judgment you have toward yourself and others. It is the sabotage that shows up when you most wish to succeed. Ooh, that's something to think about, isn't it? Isn't it? I bet there's been a time in your life where there was some thing you wanted or some project that you were working on and then you you did something that was kind of out of character for you and you, you screwed it all up and then the thing didn't work out the relationship failed the business failed you you broke up with the person uh, you got kicked out of the place and might that have been your shadow trying to get the integration that it needs the shadow of your father is a major aspect of the book. And this has got me kind of thinking about Darth Vader. You know, he's in that, he's in his black biomechanical suit and he is the dark father figure in Star Wars. And he ends up being like this big force in Luke Skywalker's life, right? So yeah, your shadow's father, like Darth Vader, it's uh, something you got to deal with one way or another. And chapter three was all about the shadow of your father. And this chapter was by far the most meaningful to me. So this chapter alone would be like worth getting the book for. And I knew that my father's shadow was something that I needed to explore when I started getting uncomfortable merely listening to the audio version of chapter three. I was headed down to the uh, Roman Springs getting the uh, water every week like I do for my family here, listening to it, and I just started getting kind of 
uncomfortable. And I was like, okay, okay, Jonathan, this is something you're going to have to confront a bit and pay some attention to. And I am uh, I'm blessed that I have a decent relationship with my dad. I actually interviewed him on this very podcast. You might want to go and listen to that. And I'm not particularly bitter or resentful of him. But when I reflect on our relationship, I know that I have a deep sense of longing for what I wanted and needed from him. What I didn't get from him, what what I still might like from him. And it's important for every man to dispense with this ego defense, which tells us, and boy, I know I have heard this voice in my head. It tells us, I'm my own man. I make my own choices, damn it. My father doesn't hold any influence or sway over my mind now. And it's important to dispense with this ego defense mechanism because, to quote from the book, and I like this line, the shadow of your father is neither good nor bad, only inescapable. And I found in the book the release the father exercise particularly liberating. It is described, write a letter to your father and create a ceremony to release him. You may write the letter and read it out to your men's group before burning it, or read the letter when hiking in the deep woods before burying it. Hopefully hopefully a bear doesn't get you, or hopefully you don't step in some uh, hiker's dog's poop. Regardless, the letter is not for your father or to be sent to him, but it should cover two important elements. Everything he did or didn't do that you've held resentment, pain, bitterness, or sadness for. Making it clear exactly what you wanted or needed from him. And then secondly, forgiving and releasing him entirely from being at fault for the man you are today. Reclaim your sovereignty. Oh boy, that's a line I like. And make it clear that you are in charge of developing yourself into the man you wish to be. Declare how you will love him and honor him moving forward as a son. And I like that topic of uh, that, that framing of honoring your father, because I know that there are men out there that their fathers did awfully abusive and neglectful things or didn't do things that they should have done that was terribly neglectful. And a lot of men find that forgiving of the father difficult. But honoring, honoring, uh, and in some cases you don't want to like have forgiveness that invites a toxic person back into your life. But the the honoring is a, a powerful thing that you can honor your father by being free to go about your life and accomplish meaningful things in your life that perpetuate the genetic legacy of your father or that add to the legacy of the last name that you share with your father. So if you don't find yourself, if if you're like, I can't forgive my father, it's, it's simply not healthy for me to forgive my father for what he did or didn't do, you can at least, you can honor the family name right? By reclaiming your uh, your sovereignty by taking responsibility and releasing your father from uh, the blame that you have for the way that your life is going. And as the book suggests, I'll refrain from sharing my letter. Didn't share it with anyone. Wrote it for myself. Although I like the idea of a men's group and sharing this kind of things with, this kind of thing with 
a men's group. And this chapter also included some helpful prompts for exploring the gradations and depths of your father's anger. Was your father angry? Mine was kind of sort of angry. He wasn't like, uh, he wasn't like beating us ruthlessly, but he definitely had some anger. And your father's anger is a seed planted in you decades ago that can bear poisonous fruit in your life. Even if you promised to never be like him, even if, let's say you had a real uh, angry, aggressive, rageful, violent father, and you said, I'm never going to be like him, and you declared that so deeply in your heart that you turned into this inassertive, nice guy that kind of lets the world walk all over you. Well, that is your father's shadow showing up in your life. And by exploring that, there is liberation. The next thing the book talks about that I actually kind of made a meme out of this because I thought it was really good, which is the, the one rule of men. And the one rule of men is don't talk about what it's like to be a man who is struggling. And I think about this, the one rule of men is kind of like the one rule of the roughnecks in that ridiculous, awesome 90s science fiction movie, Starship Troopers. Do you remember that? This was the group of uh, soldiers that gets slaughtered by giant arachnoids throughout the, uh, throughout the solar system of wherever they are trying to conquer. And if you remember, the one rule of the soldiers in Starship Troopers is everyone fights, no one quits. So that's actually two words in it. <laughs> the one rule of men makes about as much sense as the, uh, the one rule of the roughnecks. And boy, the one rule of men, this is the truth, isn't it? Men, they really do struggle to talk about what they're struggling with. And actually it's one of the most important things that we can talk about with other men. With very few exceptions, can I think of a deep, meaningful conversation, a peer-to-peer -peer type of conversation that I had with a buddy about what he was struggling with? Um, what comes to mind is there was this guy I met in uh, San Jose, Costa Rica, who was struggling a bit with his relationships with uh, women. He had just gotten out of a relationship. I think she had cheated on him. And he was, yeah, he was just not in a good place with women. And we sat down and had a real honest conversation uh, about it on a sunny patio over some coffees there. And he was able to get some stuff off his, off his chest. It was, that was a, a vulnerable conversation. And uh, actually, he was another guy who was in the nootropics industry, coincidentally enough. And uh, yeah, I think men need to have more conversations like that. The, the vast majority of conversations, peer-to-peer -peer conversations that I have with other men are just conversations bursting with uh, bragging. I think of the million stupid conversations that I've had with a buddy about how many women he was betting or how he was just killing it in his new uh, business or hustle. Next topic addressed in the book is suffering. And Connor writes, the truth about pain and suffering is that it's usually asking you to build yourself into the kind of man who knows how to respond when suffering comes knocking. A man who knows he can navigate through hardship is a man who has immense value to himself, his family, community, and the world. And yeah, so suffering is usually asking you to become a more anti-fragile man who can deal with 
the greater suffering that is coming, the, uh, those black swans of suffering that are hiding in the bushes along your path in life in the future. And this whole philosophy that he uh, espouses here is why I urge men to habituate arbitrary suffering. Because when you habituate on a daily, weekly basis, arbitrary suffering, you are just going to be all the more capable of handling the suffering that this entropic world is going to blindside you with in the future. So cold showers, oh boy, I did one of those yesterday. And it's December now here in the Balkans and the, the cold water in our plumbing, ooh, that was arduous. So the cold showers, the doing 24 hour fasts, arduous workouts, doing uh, like doing combat sports. If you're into those kinds of things, I already got my black belt in Taekwondo and I don't uh, want the injuries now, but all of that kind of, all those things that habituate uh, arbitrary discomfort and arbitrary suffering, that's going to make you just a tougher bastard that can deal with the crazy things that are just going to pop up that you're going to have to deal with in life. That those close to you that you love are going to look to you as you're going to be that stone pillar that they need in a storm. If you've been doing, if you've done a thousand cold showers, you're going to be more resolute when it is called upon you to to be. So, next topic the book addresses is women, of course. Oh boy, women and our relationships with them. This is, mm, this is a major place where we, we struggle, isn't it? I know I have. When I was single and also um, in my marriage, I have struggled. Connor writes, the truth is the way you treat and view women represents the way you treat your own feminine qualities and unconscious mind. In short, women are a mirror reflecting what you are unaware of about yourself as a man. So if you habitually treat women like crap or discard them quickly, that reflects on how you regard and respect yourself and your choices, really. If you're the kind of guy that's listening to this sort of podcast, if you're into like personal growth and you find yourself and you're habitually just discard, you sleep with them and then you get rid of them, that speaks to a gaping disconnect between your values and your actions. I know I, I have just encountered a lot of guys in this personal development kind of space that they were the kind of guys that they would like research for a month or two before they would buy a car or a new computer or take different supplements or whatever. They would do so much research to make sure that their choice was a good choice that they could stick with for, for years or longer. Yet when it comes to the, a, a, a much more impactful choice, which is the choice of the women, the kinds of women that you entangle yourself with physically, emotionally, legally, financially, when it came to that choice, they would just, they were so, uh, commitment phobic and they applied like none of all that dis all that discipline and rigor that they applied to their other choices and commitments they were so flagrant when it came to women and that speaks to uh, a deep disregard and disrespect of your own self that's something to think about connected to that is cheating and the author writes as Henry David Thoreau said the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. I was one of those men. I lived in quiet despair and desperation. 
and cheating let me believe that I was doing something with my life. As if sleeping with countless women would somehow fill the void of living without purpose. Don't get me wrong. It's one thing to date around and be intentional about enjoying an active sex life while building a meaningful existence. But when sex, women, or dating have become the way that we find meaning in our existence, we will surely be left unsatisfied and unsatiated. And the next topic is sexual freedom. And this is the topic of an entire chapter because it's something that almost every man craves, sexual freedom. And that means something a little bit different to every man. Whether he's single and not getting laid, or he's in a relationship, and but he's not really getting what he wants in the bedroom. But for me, reading the first page of this chapter, I was filled with gratitude because sexually, I feel totally free and satisfied, at least now, at this point in life. I have no yearning for something different. Uh, I have no feelings of uh, constraint. And I think this has a lot to do with the tantra, tantric practice of what I've been into for about half a decade back, uh, half, half a decade or so now because of uh, doing the tantric type of exercises. This has helped me to take back control of my sexual energy and focus. Jocko Willink, a highly decorated retired U.S. Navy SEAL and best-selling author, I'm sure you've heard his podcast, he is perhaps most famous for saying, discipline equals freedom. And that is the truth. And that applies even more so in sexual matters, in the horizontal business that we do in the bedroom. At least for me, the more disciplined I've become in the sexual realm, the more I get exactly what I want and am freed from fear of missing out, from comparison, and uh, adolescent fantasies of threesomes with green alien babes. And in the article for this book review, I have a, a photo of three green alien babes from Star Trek. The book addresses the being vulnerable thing. Has your woman told this to you? I want you to be more vulnerable with me. I bet you've heard that. And here's what Connor has to say about that. When a woman says she wants you to open up or be more vulnerable, what she is really saying is that she wants to know that you are aware of your own internal experience and capable of regulating your emotional state. She wants to be able to validate that you are in some way dealing with the stress, pressures, and chaos of your job, finances, kids, and whatever else that you have on your plate. She doesn't want to feel like you have to entirely hide what you're going through. She wants to know what it is like to go through your challenges. Yes, she may want to hear about the details of your distress and frustration, but ultimately what she is looking for is not to solve your problems with you or validate your feelings, but to know that you as a man are aware of how you are feeling and capable of navigating through it. Ooh, that's a framing that I thought that was a great paragraph. 
that just kind of demystifies this whole thing, which ends up not working out real well for a lot of men. And I appreciate that my wife doesn't bug me about being vulnerable. And going along with what Connor's saying here, I think my wife maybe doesn't bug me about this because I share with her everything that I do on the emotional regulation front. And to mention just one thing, one of the very best tools for emotional regulation that I don't think gets talked about enough in the personal development sphere, so I'm going to continue to bang on about it, is the dual and back brain training. And you can check out my other videos on this. And when I am doing this brain training consistently, I do notice that I have an uptick in the emotional regulation that I have, that there'll be something often that she does that bothers me or, or something else in life that bothers me. And as opposed to acting or speaking uh, rashly and hurtfully, I will step back and be a little bit more objective and sleep on something and then have uh, yeah, and then resolve it in a more clear-headed kind of way. So yeah, check out Dual End Back. It is boring, but it'll make you a, a better man in your relationships. And the vulnerability thing makes me think about this story that I recounted in my book, which is Don't Stick Your Dick in a Blender, How to Beat a Nice Girl Instead. And... It was a story from another couple that we know here of feelings sharing failure. So there was this uh, guy we know who had gotten his girlfriend pregnant and he was a bit younger guy. He'd gotten his girlfriend pregnant. They were having a baby and they were more or less pretty happy couple. I think they are still together. And after his daughter was born, he decided to share with his girlfriend, with the mother of his child now, some feelings that he had early on in the pregnancy. And this was probably brought about by her saying, oh, I want you to be more honest with me. D don't hold back. It's okay. You can, be, you can be vulnerable with me. And so he shared with her that Early on in the pregnancy, he had considered uh, getting out of the relationship. He had, like, she really wanted to be a mother. And so he had, he had kind of sort of, he wasn't sure if he, he was living in a country where he wasn't a citizen. And he was, he was a younger guy. He wasn't so sure that he wanted to be a father. They weren't married. I think it was a little bit of a newer relationship. And so he was kind, she really wanted to be a mother. And so he was kind of thinking, like, maybe I should let her be a single mother and I can go on with my, go on with my life. And, but then he made the right decision. He manned up and decided to, you know, decided to go and commit to her. He did the right thing. But then he made the mistake of explaining this to her. And this was a big problem. This was like big hurt feelings and drama in their relationship. And he's all confused because he's like, she told me to share my feelings and be vulnerable. So I'm sharing my feelings and I ended up doing the right thing. So why, is she be, why has she been upset for weeks over this? And yeah, this is the point with vulnerability and sharing your feelings. She she doesn't really want to know that much about your feelings. She just wants to know that you have the tools in place of dealing with your own feelings. Hopefully that may, that clarifies a couple. That could give you a bit more uh, tranquility in your relationships. I think, uh, let's see, one thing I appreciate about the book is that it didn't go to a uh, great lengths to water down its message and language to be inclusive. It speaks, frankly, to the uh, target audience, which is masculine, normal, heterosexual kind of 
Man, isn't that annoying when there's a podcast or some content that's for men and they're like, they're watering, watering, watering down, dumbing down, using a uh, modern kind of language to try to be inclusive to the kinds of people that are never going to, that don't even really care about that content. That annoys me. So I like that about this book. It also talks about sexual insecurity. And I'll admit this is something that I have struggled with. When I was a virgin in my early 20s, when I went through dry spells that lasted years, when women were constantly flaking on dates with me, and uh, when women weren't interested in me even after we had had sex. Yeah, some pangs of sexual insecurity there. Connor writes, or you might feel a deep insecurity about not being good enough for the women you're uh, with or the women you date. What is the wisdom of your insecurity trying to teach you? Do not worry about not, uh, do you worry about not being good enough in the bedroom. Maybe you should pick up a few books about sexual skills. Take a course or sign up for a workshop to better learn how to work with your own sexual arousal and energy. Most things, sexual prowess included, are skills you can acquire, deepen, sharpen, and expand over time, as long as you are committed. And that's a good point when it comes to sexual stuff, really when it comes to anything in life, you are going to suck at it unless you read books on it, unless you come up with like an action plan for skill set acquisition and honing, you're gonna suck at it. So when it comes to relationships, sexual stuff, bedroom stuff, all these things that we kind of think like, I'm a man and I should just be good at this. No, you're probably gonna suck at these things unless you uh, actively pursue some kind of education. And I'd also add to what he says here, there's something called the wisdom of the cock that tantric Taoists speak of. And this is that if your dick is uncooperative, when it comes down to down to business with a lady, maybe your dick is trying to tell you that this is not the lady for you. But if you are with the right lady, and if your uh, bedroom performance is something where there's some room for improvement, and there probably is, let's be honest, because that will bedroom increasing your bedroom performance almost. Consistently, it's going to have this cascade of improving everything else in the relationship. You'll be surprised at the uh, unexpected positive ramifications in your relationship of upping your sex game. And this is why I put together the Mastermind, Master Body, Master Her course on Tantra. And Here's the really good news about the tantric thing, if you're curious about it. An important point on this whole topic of sexual self-improvement, sexual skill set acquisition, shall we say, is that the things that improve your relationship and or your sexual stamina are often things that are very costly, that they take a lot of time and a lot of work. You can think about going to couples therapy for your relationship. That is going to be time consuming and it can also be like really expensive. Or if you want to improve your testosterone levels, that's something that consistently improves sexual performance. That And going to the gym, doing that, you're going to need to put in three, six months at the gym, hours, innumerable hours there in that domain of steel and metal to see some improvement. And with the tantric thing, with that, it is, I think, a pretty fantastic 
ROI because it takes about three weeks of practice following a program and you will, in all likelihood, after just about three weeks, you will have become a multi-orgasmic man, more, uh, much more capable of powerfully pleasing your lady. And it has been uh, such a positive thing in my life that I put together a deep dive seven part course breaking down everything that you need to know with a bunch of unconventional kind of like sex and relationship hacks. I call them relation shacks uh, that uh, I think are, is gonna make a difference. And if you're a bit curious about that, you can watch the first module for free. And that is linked over on the article for this book review. Next thing I liked about this book was the journaling prompts that it includes. And th this was by far the most impactful takeaway for me. And these are questions that challenge you to dig deep within yourself to excavate that which can liberate you from the past. And I'll give you an example from the Shadow of the Father chapter. For example, these are some questions that you would want to write the answer. You, you could, in fact, take a little bit of time after listening to this podcast and, and do some journaling on these. What I wanted my father to teach me as a boy was dot, 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 and that could be, for me, I don't know, maybe hunting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would have liked to have learned how to hunt. That would have been, that would have been a good kind of skill because right now I'm just stuck hunting at the, uh, at the grocery store. Okay, next question. When I think about myself as a boy, I feel, what do you feel? I feel just an overwhelming sense of, of nerdiness for what I was as a boy. As a child, what I needed most from my father and didn't get was, that would be a brand new Ford Mustang on my 16th birthday. I'm still a bit bitter about that. Just think of all the fun I could have had. Just kidding, that's, that's not really it for me. Okay, what my father gave me that was invaluable was, that's good, you can cultivate some gratitude there. Uh, for me, it's probably work ethic. Yeah, 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 like a lot of men, I think I got a pretty solid work ethic from dad. If I had the perfect male role model, what I would want to learn from him is blank, blank, blank. That's, what would that be for you? For, you? for me, it'd be something like, uh, Perfect male role model would have taught me at a young age to have like really good, like good taste in women. Like uh, would have like got me on the right path of getting with the right kind of woman. Okay, next question. One skill or trait I've always wanted to develop is, you know, I've always thought that I was underperforming my potential as like a male ballerina. You know, not one of those sissy ballerinas, but like one of those one of those badass male ballerinas. I, I always thought that I had some potential there. Oh, well. Oh, well. Okay, when I still act out of control, petulant, or like a child is... When would you say that is, babe? When I still act petulant and like a child? It's probably when immature. I'm... Immature. Immature. It's probably when I'm uh, uh, eating, right? Probably my dining. Yeah. Okay. The skills I want to develop are dot, dot, dot. One passion I've always wanted to pursue more actively is, so yeah, these are some great questions for some uh, introspection and then for some, uh, 
Hey, these are like good uh, New Year's resolutions type questions, actually. So if you pick up the book, I'd encourage you to not just blow through it as an audiobook. I'd encourage you to, well, even if you do go through it as an audiobook, take a Sunday afternoon, take your smart drugs, drink some green tea, and then go through the journaling prompts. And you'll learn some things about yourself that will make you a better man, that are gonna make you a happier man, getting more of what you want out of life. As I move towards my conclusion on this book review, I've got an important message that I want to leave you with. It is the best time to be a man. Yes, right now, 2023 or 2024 or whenever, yeah. You're whatever in this uh, 2020s decade that you're listening to this podcast. I'm telling you, man, it's the best time to be a man. Let me explain. And I wrote a little uh, essay to go along with this. Maybe it's something you want to share around when you when you see when you see guys being kind of pessimistic about modernity. Okay. The aeriform, digital realm of the manosphere is sometimes characterized as a monosphere because thoughtful men have a lot of complaints about modernity, about the appalling state of Western civilization, the bias and impediments we face in the contemporary workplace, the dumbing down of society, the retarded woke culture, the leftist politics wrecking our countries, and of course, the fallen state of the modern single woman. Having been steeped in Manosphere content for at least a decade myself, while living in seven different countries, I've reached the surprising conclusion that despite all that stuff, it's the best time to be a man. And that might sound a little crazy. You might say, look how hard it is to get a good job, keep up with the cost of living, meet a nice girl, stay healthy, and raise a family these days. You may say, and you're right. But I think that a man, philosophically, I think that a man should compare the ideal to, uh, should compare to the ideal and to the average. And in the final calculus, lean more towards the latter than the former. So talking about the shadow of the father, the fathering I received from my dad, it was far from ideal. But compared to the average boomer dad, and certainly the historical average, my dad did a pretty decent job. If you honestly compare life as a modern man in the roaring train wreck of the 2020s to any other era, it becomes clear that today, more than any other time, you have more freedom to architect the life you want. Compare, and you'll start to liberate yourself from the victim mindset that the state of society is holding you back. So let's compare. If I were a man like myself in, let's say, the 1980s or the 1990s, Maybe I could have made more money in the booming economy. But there was, at that time, no easy-to-find red pill knowledge about women. So I probably would have married, just simply married, the, the, the prettiest woman who's willing to sleep with me repeatedly. That is what a lot of guys do. And then she would have gotten fat from eating the toxic mainstream standard American diet, which back then we like we didn't know how bad the standard American diet was back then. We we didn't know that we didn't know to call it sad to give it that acronym. And then I can just imagine 
we would have gotten divorced and then I would have like probably lost all that money that I would have made in the better economy and maybe I would have like lost kids and, and other things as well. So that wouldn't have been any better. What if I was born in the 1960s or the 1970s? Well, watching mankind's greatest leap live on black and white television would have been very special. But then I'd get drafted and maybe go get a hard case of PTSD that nobody knew back how to treat back then in Vietnam. In the 1970s, the economy was dog shit and the culture was deeply de degenerate. This would have either ensnared me or corrupted whatever woman I ended up with. What about the 1950s? It sure, it would have been pretty sweet to afford a brand new home, a new car, a dutiful stay-at-home wife, and yearly vacations to somewhere sunny on my uh, salary as a, as a factory worker or whatever. But then my kids would grow up, go to college on my dime, and become corrupted by the burgeoning cultural Marxist movements that I would have not known them how to, I would not have known how to warn them about that. Okay, what about being born in the 1930s or the 40s? Well, the Great Depression would have made, or what about living in the 1930s or 1940s? That's what I'm getting at here. The, the Great Depression would have made, living through that, would have made our modern economy look like Zurich, Switzerland. And then I might get drafted to go off and fight and maybe die in World War II. Be one of those, be one of those guys getting his legs blown off in some mosquito-filled island in the South Pacific. No thanks. I'd rather deal with I'd rather deal with modernity. Okay, what about living in the 1910s or the 1920s? Well, if I managed to not get my face blown off in a trench in World War I or taken out by the Spanish flu, well then, if I manage to survive, then swing dancing to jazz in the roaring 20s, that would have been just spanky. And in any other era, yeah, maybe it would have been a little easier to meet a nice marriageable maiden, but almost everything about life sucked you would have had less human and civil rights. Options for personal and economic edification were next to non-existent. Your work would have been unending, back-breaking labor. Life would have been, in two words, tedious and tiresome. And you could be forced at any time to go and die in some brutal war for some king, aristocrat, or warlord. You might think that guys in other historical eras had better sex lives with better women, but actually, historically, less than 50% of men actually got the chance to reproduce. Many men simply never got to have sex because kings and warlords hoarded women in harems. In relatively recent European society, unless you achieved some success, no patriarch would give you his daughter's hand in marriage. In any era, a man's life is rife with struggle and challenge. And in their relative absence, we get weak men that make bad times. Looking at you, boomer dads. But, important point, only in modernity is that struggle and challenge overcome with the habitual rejection of comfort, which will launch you on an invigorating odyssey of personal transformation that makes you happier, healthier, and freer. Yeah, it's harder to meet a nice girlfriend these days. So stop fapping to porn, learn to day game approach women, which is an exhilarating rush, hit the gym, 
which will make you feel great about yourself. Do some meditation, which will free you in your own mind. Go salsa dancing, which is easier to learn than it looks. Learn to have some standards with women and avoid making the dumb relationship mistakes by just reading a couple of books. Yeah, the economy sucks and your nine to five may have you balling on a budget these days. So start an entrepreneurial side hustle, buy Bitcoin and hodl it until the next happening, or you can do something like what I did, which is start an online business and then move to a sunnier, friendlier country with a lower cost of living and lower tax rates. Yeah. Nowadays, most of what is sold at the grocery store is frankenfood that royally fucks with our testosterone. So don't eat that stuff. Get into biohacking, rigorously cultivate a healthy lifestyle that fortifies your male essence because you know the mainstream food and consumables are gonna are not gonna support your health. Yeah. We are becoming a low trust society in the West. Maybe you lack real friends and community. So cultivate tribe. Be more intentional about your social life. Join a martial arts club. Spend a little time daily staying in touch with people. Start a local men's group or heck, go back to church. Some, some churches can be really great. Communities. In any other era, which you are photoshopping the smallpox scars out of in your fantasies, you would have had just as many challenges holding you back from a good life. But they would have almost certainly been things that you were powerless to affect. And you would have been totally bereft of the knowledge and tools that modern man has for reclaiming his sovereignty. I have an awesome sex life because I randomly heard about Tantra on the internet. Well, that's one factor. In any other era without the internet's long tail of content uh, educating me about those sorts of things, I would have been your average two pump, chump, uh, possibly with a bitchy, unsatisfied wife under my roof. So in conclusion, I think it is the best time to be a man. I wouldn't want to have born, I wouldn't want to have been born in any other time than 1985. And then my conclusion on this book, which gets five stars from me, is as good as the tools for personal development are these days, and again, you the very best tools for liberation, transformation, are often a click or two away from you these days. As good as those tools are, your shadow still lurks. Maybe you'll make a fortune founding an AI startup. That, that's, that looks like the next thing that's going to be like the easy money business to get into it, put a couple work, put a couple years of work into it, and then get a major payday. But if you do that, uh, that doesn't mean, let's say you do that. You start an AI startup and then uh, you put in those 20 hour days on modafinil for a couple of years and then you sell it for 5 million, 10 million, 50 million. That does not mean, my friend, that you've escaped the gravity well of your personal history. And your shadow is not bad or good, but simply inescapable, to paraphrase the book, which you should read so that your shadow doesn't drag you to hell. I'm Jonathan with Limitless Mindset. These are all my thoughts on this book about masculinity. I liked it quite a bit. If you perhaps have some thoughts on 
If, if you do some of those journaling prompts and there's some epiphanies and discoveries, I wouldn't mind hearing about those. If you wanna shoot me an email or drop a comment below this presentation, yeah, that might be something where we can get some good feedback going on. I look forward to a continued conversation with you.